Hi everybody, I'm Kelly Posner, Principal Investigator for the Suicide Risk Assessment at Columbia University. I always have to start this presentation with a statement of disclosure, which is, all of our original work was funded by the FDA, and my institution has had research support as part of efforts to help execute regulatory requests, and I have never had any personal compensation at any time. All right, well, we're here to discuss administration of this scale, but I always like to start with a few minutes on the public health story behind its use and why it's actually a good thing that we're doing it. And that begins with the fact that the field of medicine and even psychiatry has been challenged by a lack of clarity as to how to define suicidal occurrences. And corresponding to that, we've had no well-defined terminology, which very much cuts across research and clinical settings. So what happens is the same adverse event gets called 12 different things. Suicide attempt, not a suicide attempt, threat, gesture, and often the labels are negative, like manipulative, non-serious, but based on incorrect notions as to the relationship between seriousness and lethality. So somebody hears, oh, she only took four pills, we can't call that suicidal, when the data actually tells us something else. This will clearly have negative implications on how we manage if we can't properly identify ideation and behavior, we certainly can't understand, manage, or treat it no matter where we're trying to do so. This problem has had profound impact on our drug safety questions, but it even limits our confidence in epidemiological statistics because if everybody's defining things differently, how can we compare across settings? In clinical trials, we can't interpret what we're needing to make sense of. So adverse events that should be called suicidal are missed, and things that are inappropriately called suicidal. Now these next slides are examples of the problem that I'm talking about, and they come from the various RCTs that went into the FDA safety findings. And again, they, they reflect the problem. The first one says, patient attempted to hang himself with a rope. Investigator did not consider this a serious adverse event but rather part of the personality disorder. So you see, suicidality was not indicated in that label. The overdose of six capsules was in fact intentional, yet called accidental overdose. This next one we call the slap heard round the world because it's been written a lot about. In fact, this scale about two years ago was on the front page of the New York Times because suicide assessment has become such a big issue. And this example was in there because it really tells the story. Somebody somewhere called a slap in the face a suicide attempt. Now clearly a slap in the face should not be called a suicide attempt. And what it shows you is that it's not about drug companies or investigators covering things up because it shouldn't be called that. It's about the fact that there's been no training or standardization in how to do this. Here's another one on the bottom. This is a schizophrenic, hit his head on the wall, explained it was like his thoughts were about to explode, inappropriately called suicide attempt. So that's the problem. What happens when we start to do something about it? Well, when we first applied a standardized approach, beginning with the antidepressants, it led to a 50% reduction in suicide attempts, a 50% reduction in the harm ratio, which shows you why we needed to do better. And that's consistent with findings that misclassification can lead to overestimation of true risk in this context. But even that's not enough, doing something systematic. And what I mean by that is all the previous trials, including psychiatry trials, have not been designed to answer the questions we needed answered. They weren't set up to assess for suicidality. So in the previous risk findings, we had to make the best sense of limited information. We had to rely on spontaneously generated adverse events. The problem with doing that is that people on active medications have more side effects, headache, stomach ache, whatever it may be. It may just be that an investigator had more contact with a subject because of increased side effects, 
and therefore more time to hear about suicidal occurrences, as opposed to it being a true difference in risk. And we have many analyses where when we have systematic data, we don't see the risk we see with adverse events. So the first thing we're doing here is avoiding false or misleading results. Now this scale was actually first designed in a national trial to meet the need for something to track suicidality and look at change. It is the prospective counterpart of the system we developed for the FDA, which is why FDA and other agencies are often asking for its use whenever we have the luxury of collecting new data. It was developed by a number of leading experts. It's actually a collaboration with Beck's group. You may be familiar with their depression and suicide scales. It's evidence-based and it's low burden. It's got a very short administration time. But it uniquely assesses both behavior and ideation. Even when we do one of those large suicide studies and we can take as much time as we want, we have to do one measure of ideation, one of behavior. Nothing had really put them together. It's simply a one to five rating for suicidal ideation from a wish to die through an active thought of killing oneself with plan and intent. It can be as little as two questions for ideation. So you say, have you wished you were dead or wished you could go to sleep and not wake up? Or have you actually had any thoughts of killing yourself? If the answer is no to both of those questions, there is no ideation, so you move on to behavior. Behavior covers the spectrum. It fixes the problems we've seen in the past. It gives you the definitions. It gives you the questions to ask to figure out what to call something. It's what we call semi-structured, and that means it's a flexible format. The questions are provided as helpful tools. It's not required to ask any or all of them, just enough to get the right answer. The most important thing is for you to gather enough information to decide if you should call something suicidal or not. So for example, if you say, have you made a suicide attempt? And the patient says, yes, I took 50 pills because I definitely wanted to die. You'll see in a few moments you have enough information to call that a suicide attempt and you don't need to ask additional unnecessary questions. Sources of information. With questionnaires like this, you're encouraged to use any and all sources of information that inform your best answer. Typically, the subject gives you the best insight into their suicidality, but that's not always the case. Let's say a, a husband or wife of your subject calls you up and tells you about their husband or wife, your subject being in the hospital, this is what they wrote in the suicide note. You will have enough information to check off attempt on your form according to the other source of information and you don't necessarily need to speak to the subject directly. Okay, this is the range of types of ideation and what this is doing is articulating what we've been trained in psychiatry to do for many years. It just hasn't necessarily been spelled out like this. Once again, beginning with a wish to die, have you wished you were dead or wished you could go to sleep and not wake up? Or have you actually had any thoughts of killing yourself? Again, no to both of those questions. There is no ideation. You move on to behavior. However, if it's yes to the second question, have you actually had any thoughts of killing yourself? Then you ask three, four, and five. Have you been thinking about how you might do this? Have you had these thoughts and had some intention of acting on them? Or have you started to work out or worked out the details of how to kill yourself? You can't have methods, intent, or plan if you don't have a thought of killing yourself. Those are subcategories of it. Now, once you determine if there is a thought, you ask a few follow-up questions about the most severe thought. We're gonna go through the questions, but the reason those questions are there is because Beck's group went through the scale of suicidal ideation with us and those were the items that were significantly predictive of completed suicide. So if there is a thought about the most severe, you say, how many times have you had these thoughts? When you have the thoughts, how long do they last? Can you stop thinking about killing yourself or wanting to die if you want to? 
Are there things, anyone or anything, like family, religion, pain of death, that stopped you from wanting to die or thinking about committing suicide? And finally, what sorts of reasons did you have for thinking about wanting to die or killing yourself? Was it to end the pain or stop the way you were feeling? In other words, you couldn't go on living with, with how you were feeling. Or was it to get attention, revenge, or a reaction from others? Or both? And we know if somebody says it was to stop or end the pain, that's more serious than otherwise. So if they have more frequency, longer duration, less control, fewer deterrents, and it's to stop or end the pain, that's when we worry more and that informs your clinical judgment. The other thing that informs your clinical management is when do we go to the next step? Well, our guidance is when they have a four or five, intent or plan and intent. That becomes particularly important in non-psychiatry trials. So for example, in obesity trials, there's an FDA guidance that says only when someone has a four or five is when you trigger referral to a mental health professional. And what we think that's doing is reducing a lot of unnecessary burden and exclusions from studies and, and walks to ERs. Okay, we're moving on to behavior. And the behavior section is driven by this definition of suicide attempt, which is a self-injurious act committed with at least some intent to die as a result of the act. First of all, it says self-injurious act. It doesn't say self-injury. There does not have to be any injury or harm, just the potential for it. So if a man puts a gun in his mouth and he pulls the trigger, and luckily the gun failed to fire, even though he wasn't hurt, that became a suicide attempt as soon as he pulled that trigger. There does not have to be physical injury. Then it says with at least some intent to die, well, when people are feeling suicidal, they often have mixed motives. It just has to be that any part of them was doing this to end their life for us to call it a suicide attempt. So if 5% of them wanted to kill themselves and 95% wanted to make their girlfriend angry, that's what it gets called. It used to be somebody would say, did you want to kill yourself? The answer would be no, they'd move on. Very often with that second question, did any part of you want to kill yourself, you get a very different answer. And then it says, as a result of the act. That means the behavior and the intent must be linked. It must be the why, at least in part. Sometimes people cut because they're self-mutilating and they always have a background suicidal thought. Those two things do not equal a suicide attempt. It must be the why, at least in part. And finally, we can infer intent clinically from behavior or circumstance. One way we can do that is if someone denies intent to die, but they thought it could have killed them. Another is what we call clinically impressive circumstances. That's a highly lethal act where no other intent but suicide can be inferred, like trying to shoot oneself in the head, or jumping from an eighth story, or setting oneself on fire, or taking 200 pills. No matter what they say, we can't infer anything but that. Now the other important thing to note about what we call suicide attempts is as soon as the first pill is swallowed or the first scratch with a knife is made, even if they change their mind two seconds later and you know logically it couldn't have hurt them yet, it doesn't matter. As soon as that pill has been swallowed or that scratch has been made, it's already become a suicide attempt. Now remember I said you don't have to ask any or all questions, just what you need? Well, it may be that a subject doesn't recognize something should be called a suicide attempt. So it may take you that second question. Have you done anything to harm yourself for you to even know that you have something to assess? And what we're doing is distinguishing attempts from non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. That's when they engage in the behavior purely 100% for reasons other than to end one's life. What we think of as self-mutilation, that's to relieve internal pain, feel better, feel something. Or what we call affecting external circumstances. That's like if a man goes up to the roof because he believes people will feel sorry for him if they think he's suicidal. He actually has no intention of ending his life. He just wants to get sympathy from others. 
Well, if that man accidentally fell to his death, that's just what we would call it, an accidental death, because there was no suicidal intent associated with it. Okay, these are some cases from our hospital that we're going to go through together. The first one says, the patient wanted to escape from her mother's home. She researched lethal doses of ibuprofen. She took six ibuprofen pills and said she felt certain from her research that this amount was not enough to kill her. She stated she did not want to die only to escape from her mother's home. She was taken to the hospital where her stomach was pumped and she was admitted to a psychiatric ward. Do you think that's a suicide attempt? Should we call that a suicide attempt? No, absolutely right. We shouldn't call that a suicide attempt. And there are a few important things to note about this case. All over this girl's record, it said suicide attempt. It wasn't until somebody took the time to ask the question, why? Why did you do it? That we got better, more reliable information. And we think that will always be the case. The other thing is, she also had suicide attempts. And she was very able to say, on these occasions I wanted to kill myself, but here I didn't. And the point is, you have to assess each occurrence independently. Don't assume if one thing was suicidal that the next thing will be because they come together in the same patients. And it's very important for your outcomes or your risk assessment to know the difference between four suicide attempts and one. Young woman following a fight with her boyfriend felt like she wanted to die, impulsively took a kitchen knife and made a superficial scratch to her wrist. Before she actually punctured the skin or bled, however, she changed her mind and stopped. Is that a suicide attempt? Yes, it is. Remember, as soon as that first scratch was made, it became a suicide attempt. Patient was feeling ignored. She went into the family kitchen where her mother and sister were talking. She took a knife out of the drawer and made a cut on her arm. She denied she wanted to die at all, not even a little, but just wanted them to pay attention to her. Right, that is not a suicide attempt. There is no suicidal intent associated with what she did. Patient cut her wrist after an argument with her boyfriend. Patient cut her wrist after an argument with her boyfriend. So there's not enough information in this case to answer the question. We know what she did, we just don't know why she did it. And both self-mutilation and suicidal behavior have stressors that precipitate them. So argument with boyfriend doesn't tell you anything. Had a big fight with her ex-husband, took 15 to 20 amipramine, went to the hospital, drank charcoal, unable to verbalize clear intent, but state she was well aware of the dangers of TCA overdose and the potential for death. So yes, we can call that a suicide attempt as well, because remember, you can infer it if they thought it could be lethal. Okay. Now there are some other suicidal behaviors that are also important to assess. They just don't reach the threshold of an attempt. And the first one is called an interrupted attempt. That's when a person starts to take steps to end their life, but someone or something stops them. So they're on the ledge poised to jump, somebody grabs them back. She has a gun in her hand, somebody grabs it out of her hand. An aborted attempt is exactly the same thing, but they stop themselves. So he goes up to the roof, he turns around and changes his mind. She has a gun in her hand, she puts it down. And the final category is any other behavior, saying something is not a behavior, but any other behavior with suicidal intent, collecting or buying pills, purchasing a gun, writing a will or suicide note. So the question is, have you taken any steps towards making a suicide attempt or preparing to kill yourself, such as collecting pills, getting a gun, giving valuables away, or writing a suicide note? So the very examples are in the question for you to ask the subject. Now for suicidal behavior, you want to select everything that's appropriate, but you only want to select something if it's a discrete behavior. So for example, if somebody wrote a suicide note as part of an actual attempt, you wouldn't check off preparatory behavior and actual attempt because it was part of the actual attempt, and you don't want to overcount things. The other thing to note about suicidal behavior is if 
there's ideation as part of the behavior, which usually there is, you only indicated it in the behavior. If there's a suicide attempt, you don't check off an ideation answer and a behavior answer because it's part of the behavior. Now this is the attempt section and I just want to highlight a few things. First of all, it's the only one with multiple questions. And remember I said you don't have to ask any or all questions, just what you need. Look at that last indented question. Or did you think it was possible you could have died from? Remember if they deny intent, you can infer it if they thought it could be lethal. So you may need that question to get to the right answer. It just gives you the tools you may need to get to the right place, we think. And then at the bottom it says, has subject engaged in non-suicidal self-injurious behavior? We think that's really important because what that does is give you credit for having appropriately assessed something and ruling it out. If that weren't there for the self-mutilation cases, etc., it would just be nose down the page and it wouldn't be reflected that you asked the right questions and decided something shouldn't be called suicidal. Completed suicide is on the form. It can happen in any setting. A similar example to the one I gave before, let's say a husband or wife of your subject calls you up and tells you about your subject's tragic suicide, or you may have medical examiner records. If you have enough information, that is what you would indicate. Lethality. We answer a lethality question for potential suicide attempts only. And if there was medical damage, we answer it in terms of what actually happened in terms of medical damage. Not what could have happened or should have happened, but what actually happened. This is the item. This is a compilation of the Beck Medical Lethality Rating Scale. This is a zero through five. Zero is no physical damage or very minor physical damage, e.g. surface scratches. So even a surface scratch can be a zero. Four is severe physical damage, medical hospitalization, not psychiatric, because we're talking about medical damage here. But to circle the right answer, you need to ask one or two open-ended questions. So for example, if they cut, did it require a Band-Aid or a bandage? Did it bleed a little or profusely? Again, to be able to circle the right answer. Now, if there is no medical damage, like the gun that failed to fire, we answer one question about potential lethality. Another example where we would do that would be if somebody laid on the train tracks with an oncoming train, but they were pulled away before they were run over. As soon as they laid on those train tracks, by the way, that became an actual attempt, and both of those would be a two. Behavior likely to result in death despite available medical care. Because if they had been run over by the train or the gun had not failed to fire, likely they would have died no matter what. Now on the form it says, if yes, please describe. What's the most important thing to write there or in your free text? What did they do and why did they do it? The pieces of evidence of why you did or didn't call something suicidal. Always remember to assess ideation and behavior independently. Don't assume if they deny ideation, they won't have behavior. There are people who think they've never had a suicidal thought in their life that will tell you they've made suicide attempts because they don't make the connection. Time frames. The first time you do this in a new study, for behavior, you're capturing all lifetime occurrences, the total number of attempts ever, etc. But for ideation, we treat it a little bit differently because it would be hard to average a thought across a lifetime. It wouldn't be very representative. So the reference time point there is the time they were feeling the most suicidal. The time in your life you were feeling the most suicidal, did you wish you were dead, etc. And actually Beck's group finds that time frame to be the most predictive of completed suicide. So it seems to have the most clinical meaning. And in, sometimes this scale is being put in the middle of ongoing trials because some good data is better than no good data or for safety monitoring. In that case, there's something called an already enrolled subjects version. And that baseline covers two periods, prior to study start and since study start. 
So before you came into the study, how many attempts had you made, and how about from the study start till now? And whichever the case, every time you see the patient after that, you use the since last assessment version, since last visit, and that captures all events and types of thoughts since the last assessment. Since I last saw you, have you done anything or had thoughts of? So a few more case examples. Patient experienced heartbreak. She took four clonazepam, called a girlfriend, and talked her credit out. She was dismissive of its seriousness, but indicated she wanted to die at the time she took the overdose. Now, what would we call that? An attempt, interrupted, or aborted? Attempt, interrupted, or aborted? It would be called an attempt, because remember, as soon as she took that first pill, it became a suicide attempt. During pill count, the study staff discovered that six tablets were missing. Upon questioning, the patient admitted she was saving them up so she could take them all together at a later time in order to kill herself. Interrupted, aborted, or preparatory behavior? Preparatory behavior. Collecting pills is the very example that's even in the question. Patient reported he first started thinking about killing himself when he was 12. He thought about how easy it would be to pretend to fall in front of a bus before it was able to stop so that it would look like an accident. Although he thought about it often, he said he didn't have the courage to do it. Now that's obviously ideation, but the type of ideation is thoughts with methods. This isn't a plan yet. A plan would be more detailed. A plan is next Tuesday at three o'clock, I'm gonna go into my husband's medicine cabinet when I know he's gonna be away at the office so he can't come home to stop me. A plan would be more detailed. Now, one of my final points is that often in studies like this, we have depression rating scales, and they usually have a suicide item in them, and we say to ourselves, why isn't that enough? Why do we have to do more? This is from something called the PHQ-9, which Dr. Spitzer, who developed the DSM, and Janet Williams, it's their wonderful scale developed in primary care for symptoms of depression. But the suicide item says, thoughts that you would be better off dead or of hurting yourself in some way. Well, first of all, we don't even consider better off dead even to be passive suicidal ideation. We don't consider it to be on the spectrum of suicidality. The only thing that the evidence has ever shown to be warranted is a wish to die. Beck's work has shown a wish to die to be significantly predictive of completed suicide. Hurting yourself can be self-mutilation, suicidality, again, setting you up for false positives. And we actually have studies where this item is followed by the SSRS, and that's what we see. When you ask the right questions about suicidality, you do away with cases that should have never been called suicidal in the first place. Now, there's a lot of clinical lore in the field that asking these questions is going to cause somebody to be suicidal. But the data tells us something different. Dr. Gould, who's an author on the SSRS, has a seminal article in JAMA 2005 indicating that asking these questions does not cause distress or suicidality. Now this is my email. It's also on the front of your form and I really encourage you to reach out if you have any questions about how to give the scale, what to call something. And these last few slides are just for your reference. This first one reflects all of the different types of indication where the scale has been used for quite a while across all of psychiatry, but really across most of non-psychiatry as well. And this one shows you where it's being used clinically and internationally or about to be used. World Health Organization Europe best practices, it's about to go into the U.S. Army, inpatients, outpatients, hospitals, emergency rooms, general medical, psychiatric, um, schools, college campuses, VAs, national organizations, the, the uh, American CDC surveillance definitions are now the Columbia definitions essentially. So to us, this is the very good news because what this reflects, hopefully, is that we're all beginning to speak the same language, which will in turn, hopefully, also foster more precise communication. And in clinical trials, it's across all phases. It's over 90 languages, all types of interventions, but not just for safety. Because if an intervention works, suicidality may be reduced, and it's nice to have something to document that. And it's also 
increasingly used to operationalize inclusion exclusion. You know, in the past it used to say serious risk, acute risk, bad risk, and nobody knew what the heck that meant. So it's helping to, to operationalize that, that, that more. So on that note, that is the end of my formal presentation, and I thank you for your attention.